My name is Carl McDonald. Today is August 21st, 2014, and I'm in Maryville, Tennessee to interview Mr. A.B. Goddard. This interview is taking place as a part of the Legal History Project of the Fellows of the Tennessee Bar Foundation. May we have your name, please, sir? Uh, Arthur Boyd Goddard. You go by A.B. to most people, is that correct? That's correct. You mind if I use A.B. when we visit today? Not at all. Your date and place of birth? Uh, July the 13th, 1925, in Knoxville. Why Knoxville? Well, my mother's doctor was Dr. McCrennell, who was reared in Friendsville, which is located in Blunt County, but his practice was in Knoxville, and his practice in hospitals was in Knoxville, and I was born in the hospital. Mother was a little older than most people were when I was born. <laughs> Tell us about your uh, paternal grandparents, the Goddards. Well, uh, James Monroe Goddard. My grandfather had an affinity for naming his children after famous people, especially generals in the Civil War. And my grandmother was Tamela, and she was a French. Uh, what did your grandfather do? Well, he was principal at the Porter Academy for a while. He was a professor at Grant College, which turned out into being Tennessee Wesleyan College. And he was a farmer. Here in Blount County? No, in, in uh, Loudoun County. Loudoun County, okay. When did... Uh... What did your maternal grandmother, did she work out of the house? No, she had children. Okay. What, uh, these famous names that you talked to your grandfather gave to, what, give us an example of some of those names, the, the generals well, that. One of them was Grant, and one was Burnside, and then, of course, my grandfather was Monroe, which wasn't a Civil War, but he was a president. Okay. Uh, what about your maternal grandparents? Who were they? And uh, John Pickens and uh, Jane Boyd. And John's mother was a sister to Sam Houston. And he had a grocery store on Broadway and he uh, hauled uh, salted meat to uh, Charleston and brought back furniture. And we have in the family some of the furniture he brought back. One was a four-poster bed with a trundle bed, which is a little low bed that fit under the uh, four-poster. And my grandmother, Pickens, who lived with us for a while, slept on the four-poster in Houston, and I, when we were very young, slept on the Toronto bed. Now, they had an empty room in front of the house, but they didn't seem fit to use it. Well, why did they want you and your brother Houston to sleep on the floor? <laughs> well, it wasn't exactly on the floor. There was a mattress but it was close to being on the floor because it had to fit under the bed. And when I was born, both of my paternal grandparents were dead, and so was my maternal grandfather. The only uh, grandparent I knew was the one that lived with us, and she was nine years old when the Civil War started. 
Uh, so tell us about your father. Well, one other thing about grandfather. Oh, I'm sorry. Peyton. Excuse me. He, in 1900, he was elected the first Democrat chair for Bunt County after the Civil War. The Republicans held their nominating process in a convention environment, and they walked through lines so they could be counted. And a great dispute arose that they were counting them twice. So that's the way he got elected, and then it was several years before anybody else of that party was elected. Now, Blunt County is pretty much a Republican county, isn't it? Yes. So a Democrat being elected in there that There weren't thing. many slaves in Blunt County, only in certain families, and they were household slaves. There isn't enough flat land to use uh, uh, slave labor effectively. But there still were African American slaves in, in uh, at that time. Yes. Here. Okay. Uh, your father's name was Homer Andrew Goddard. Yes. When was your dad born? April twenty seventh, eighteen ninety one. Was he born here in Blunt County? Yes. Okay. Uh, did he have a nickname? Bully. Was it? And an he deserved it. <laughs> Where did he get it? Where did the name come from? When he was growing up, he threw a boy's cap into the creek, and uh, that they called him a bully, and it stuck. What did your father do for a living? He was a lawyer. Uh, where did he get his education? Well, he, I don't know where he got his under high school education. Uh, but there was very little public education, and the Maryville College ran a preparatory school, and I'm sure mother and father both went to that preparatory school, which was probably at least the high school. College? Did he go to college? Went to Maryville College. Both of them did. Both of them graduated in 1912. Then he went to law school at UT and graduated in 1915. And then started practicing law? Yeah, well, he went to Chicago for one quarter of a advanced education. But after that, he, yes, he went to practice. He was solo practice or with Jansen Tweed, who later became a municipal judge in Ohio, uh, and then he uh, joined the firm of Gamble Crawford, and it became Gamble Crawford and Goddard. And is that, are we still the remnants of that firm? Yes. Do we have any idea when that happened? Well, uh, Duncan Crawford, who is uh, the grandson of uh, Judge Crawford, and I have tried to find out when they started practicing together, but we have not determined exactly, but we know that it's been over a hundred years. Okay. Uh, and that firm, uh, Crawford, Crawford, and Newton, as it's called now, came from the same a firm that Goddard and Gamble came from. Uh, when Joe Gamble, which was the son of Judge Gamble, graduated from uh, law school, and that was about the same time that John C. Crawford Jr. graduated from law school, and it was felt that five lawyers in Maryville was too many to have in one firm, so the firm split. And Judge Crawford and John, his son, uh, went one way, and Judge Gamble and Dad and Joe went another way. We started in the other side of the hall in this uh, same location and have been here all the time. 
What did your mother major in at the college? Uh, I, I can't tell you that. What did she do when she finished the college? Well, she taught high school, taught mathematics, and she was the principal part of the time at least uh, during uh, her teaching years before she was married. My father thought he had to have $10,000 in the bank before he could get married. So it took him a while. Do you know when your parents got married? Uh, no, I do not. I forgot to ask your mother's name. Bell, Alice Bell. And she was a Pickens? She was a Pickens. When was your mother born? Uh, June the 27th, 1891. Okay. And, uh, I, your, your dad practiced law until he, uh, until what, he had a stroke, I think you told me? Yes, he had a stroke the same day I took the Bar Association exam in February of 1951. Okay, but he did he continue to do some practice until he passed in 1960? No, no he did not. Uh, he kept his connection with the Bank of Maryville. He was chairman of the board and on the finance committee which met every week, uh, but he didn't do any practice or any office work as a lawyer. Did Sometimes we would take him some documents to look at that we had drafted, and he was never very complimentary. <laughs> Did your dad hold public office anywhere? Well, not unless you characterize the attorney for a municipality and the public office. He was uh, the original attorney for the city of Alcoa. He was the attorney for the city of Maryville at, diff at times and also the attorney for Blount County and was on the, the first a constitutional revision committee that was appointed by the governor. Tennessee had the oldest unamendment, unamended constitution of any state in the Union. And he was on that uh, committee as well as one of my professors in constitutional law at the University of Tennessee. Did your mom teach school at different times? Well, she came back during uh, during the war, Second World War. Uh, teachers were hard to find, and she taught that year. I mean, those years at Everett with Bob Davis was principal at that time. Now you had a brother named Houston Monroe. Yes. When was Mr. Houston born? January the 1st, 1927. And uh, you all were raised together here in Maryville? Uh, some say we were. <laughs> <laughs> we were not very good children. Am I, should I ask about that or should I go on? Well, there's one story that may bear repeating. We had a tennis court and we uh, acted up at the tennis court. Dad owned it and bought it. And he represented Crescent Amusement Company, so we had a pass to the movie. And we had bicycles. And his punishment when he found out we had acted up was that we couldn't go to the show for a month. We couldn't ride our bicycles for a month. We couldn't go out of the yard for a month. And my mother asked, who are you punishing? <laughs> how, uh, how, how, what was the age difference between you and Houston? Uh, 17 months. 
what public offices did Houston hold? He was judge, first Republican judge of the Court of Appeals, several Court of Appeals in the history of the state of Tennessee. And I believe he was- I had to get that dig in. <laughs> and I believe he went on the bench in September of 1974. Uh, you, I'm certain you're right. Well, I don't remember exactly. We all thought he took the judgeship so he wouldn't have to clean up his office. It was a mess. <laughs> and before then, he served in the state senate? Yes. Okay. And tell us about your wife. Well. What's her name? Eula Gray Fortner. She was a Fortner from Claiborne County. And where did you meet your wife? Well, we went to the same church, and she's two years older than I am, so we kind of grew up together and went to school. She always went to to uh, Maryville Public Schools and the high school and the university, and she was secretary to the uh, second in command in the treasurer's office while she worked before we were married. When were you all married? Where? 1951, November the 2nd, and I forgot that date one time and it cost me dearly. And we were married in Muck County in First United Methodist Church. And that's where you all still worship? Yes. How many years have you been a member of First United Methodist Church in Maryville? Well, we were trying to count that up the other day, and we think she's been a member 80 years, and I'm in excess of 75. And you told us you worked at UT uh, until what, till, she, till you started having your children? Yes. Uh, they didn't allow pregnant women to work at that time, and as soon as she started showing, she uh, resigned. You've got two children? Two. Uh, give us the name of your son, a date Robert birth. Newton, and he was named after his maternal grandfather, uh, as far as the Newton's concerned and he practices law with this firm and has ever since he graduated from law school. He also went to UT? Yes. And your daughter? She... Uh, Give us her name. Melissa Jane Goddard Bernhardt. And she lives in Atlanta and she is deeply involved in bridge. She and an associate have printed, drafted and printed all sorts of bridge books and in pamphlets and instructions. And she has a 150 students starting out in this fall. Uh, in different classes. Do you play bridge? Yes. And I think I'm better than she is, but <laughs> I, I, I don't say that in her presence. <laughs> you sent Melissa to University of North Carolina for undergraduate education? She decided that's where she was going. She decided that issue? Yes. But your son, Rob, when he went to UT? Yes. Okay. Tell us about your grandchildren. Well, Richmond is some kind of stock analysis, but he's not practicing that. He's with a reclamation firm that uh, uh, buys up property that's been uh, contaminated and they clear it and resell it. And he was recently married. Where is he living now? In Atlanta. And did he get, where did he get his education? It was at he Vanderbilt? Went to Vanderbilt. Okay. 
Does Richmond have a brother? Yes, Andrew, and he went to SMU in business school. He had some handicap, but he was able to excel in math. And so he took the business degree and they have a five-year program and they have mentors in business and he uh, is now a CPA. He took the exams and passed all of them the first time and we were rather excited about that in view of his limitations. And he has a bride to be that also went to SMU. She did, her parents live in Atlanta now. She did not live in Atlanta, uh, but uh, Andrew met her there, and her name's Sarah. And she is also a CPA with a different firm, both national firms, but I can't tell you the name. Uh, but they both asked for transfers to Atlanta because they wanted back there. And uh, that's where they're going to be married. And they were both granted transfers. And Andrew's working in Atlanta now. And uh, Sarah's still in Dallas, but she's coming back before the wedding, which is supposed to be in October. Okay. And what about Rachel? Rachel's in Hawaii. She's a has her doctor's degree in anthropology. Uh, her husband has his doctor's degree in some other field, but it's close. And she uh, is expecting a child. She's six months pregnant. You were born. You were raised in Maribel. Yes. Graduated from high school when? 1943. I was the class president of the senior year, and was either the valedictorian or the salutatorian. And since I can't remember which. My inclination would be that I was second. <laughs> <laughs> then where did you go? Did you, did you immediately go over to UT to go to school? Yes, during the summer first summer quarter of 1943. And what happened uh, after the end of the summer quarter? Well, I was of draft age, and in November I was drafted, and sent to Green Bay for basic training. I was put in the Navy, and I suspect that was because I had one quarter of college education. Okay. What did you do? You say you went to Green Bay, Wisconsin for your basic training? Yes. Okay, and after you finished your basic training, then where were you sent? To San Diego to Sonar Repair school where I tried to learn how to repair sonar equipment. And then after you were trained to do that, were you immediately... About two months, I was transferred to Port Orange, Texas, to get a ship, and we got the Doyle Sea Barns, or I did, and it was... Uh, the number was 353. Let me back up a minute. When you went to law school, when you went to undergraduate school in UT in the summer of 1943, was that something that your mom and dad paid for? Yes. Did you commute or did you live in Knoxville? I think I commuted. commuted excuse me. Uh, I don't remember living in Knoxville at that time. Let me back up one more stage. When you were growing up, here in, in the high school and junior high, did you have summer employment? Uh, no. I, 
in high school, I came down and hung around the office all summer. I don't remember being paid, but I'm sure they gave me money to ride the bus to Knoxville to try to get papers signed when we didn't have a judge. And one time I went over there when I didn't have a driver's license. And the judge, when I presented him the paper, said, she doesn't pray. And he handed him back to me. And of course, I didn't know what he was talking about. But I brought him back to the office. And uh, I later determined that Praying was asking for what relief you want to be granted to you. I had another experience in, after I was able to drive in high school. I, my father didn't like to drive, so he, I took him to Sevierville to try a lot suit in Chancery Court, which at that time, all chancery lawsuits were tried on depositions. There was no oral proof. And we had a judge coming from Middle Tennessee, Chancellor, and when he called the case, the lawyer on the other side said, Judge, I don't think we can try this case. The file's missing. And Dad said, Your Honor, I anticipated that. And I have a certified copy of the entire file from the clerk and master. And I filed it and asked that we try it on this copy. And the judge turned down, to, I mean, looked down at the other attorney and said, do you have any objection? And of course he didn't. And of course he lost his lawsuit. <laughs> But that was my first <coughs> experience <coughs> uh, hearing a full trial. Okay, now this ship that you told us that you were assigned to, the uh, the USS Doyle C. Barnes, number 353. I think he was, it was named after a pilot. Okay. Uh, what type of a ship was it? D.E., Destroyer Escort, which is less in size than the regular destroyer. It had a 12, a five inch gun on the front and an aircraft gun placed all around the fuselage of the ship. What was its purpose? What, what was a destroyer escort to do? Well, it was to escort unarmed vessels or lightly armed vessels, and to seek and destroy submarines, and they had uh, uh, the right depth charges that went down uh, when we thought we had uh, made contact with the submarine. How many? How many members in the crew? I don't, I, I can't tell you. I'd say about a hundred, but yeah. I'm guessing. At that, in World War II, was it, was it unusual to be drafted into the Navy rather than the Army or the Marines? Uh, I don't know. That That's information that I have no earthly idea about. Do you know why it was that you ended up in the Navy rather than? I think it was because I had a one quarter of college. Where did you? Now, it may have been that on that particular day, at that particular time, the Navy got the first joy. <laughs> <laughs> Being egotistical that I am. Tell us about this ship. For example, where did you sleep? Slept in the mess hall. Uh, there were three tier bunks against the wall. Uh, that were very hard to sleep in. When we were in heavy seas, uh, 
they served the meal on a, a aluminum pl uh, tray. Tray. And when the people would load up and come to their table and put the tray down so they could sit down, it might hit the ceiling the next time. And of course, it would just a lob lolly of food all over the floor. How what? Fortunately, we weren't in that kind of weather very often. How was the food? Terrible. <laughs> The best food we had, but most of it was reconstructed uh, eggs and and uh, cabbage. I remember. But the best meal we had was on Saturday, because they served us baked beans and cornbread, and there wasn't much way to mess it up. Did you all see what I would call combat? Were you? Not much. We were spent, after we went on our shakedown crew to Boston, we went through the Panama Canal and to straight to the South West Pacific. Uh, and we were first engaged in escorting supply ships to Lady Gulf in the Philippines because that's where MacArthur had landed not too long before. And that we had an interesting story. We were the lead ship of a squadron of six DEs. And we uh, were coming back from a run up to Lady Gulf. And we saw this vast array of ships of all sizes and description on the horizon. And our captain, uh, four star, four stripe captain who was a, over the whole squadron, had the signal man to signal the, uh, what I think was a battleship. Uh, destination and estimated time of arrival. And the signal man ordinarily, and signed his name as captain, signal man ordinarily writes the message out and hands it to him. But this was so good that he uh, read it aloud so we could all hear it. And the reply was, none of your damn business. <laughs> and it was signed by an admiral, <laughs> which uh, then after the war was over, we went to Manila and we went to Borneo and they had a piece of, of uh, uh, equipment sonar equipment that wasn't operating and they asked me to try to fix it. And they didn't have any, any schematic drawings of it, didn't have any spare parts for it. So I undertook to start changing out of my supply of spare parts, capacitors and resistors and was just lucky enough to uh, fix it, and it, it ran perfectly. We then went up the Yangtze River to Shanghai, and since we hadn't been anywhere where you could spend any money, we had Peking duck under glass at the Imperial Hotel. How was it? It was delicious. <laughs> then we came back down to Sing Tao, and there's where I caught, got a uh, troop ship back to the States. And it took us 30 days to get from Sing Tao to San Francisco. 
then we were quarantined 10 days because they thought we were carrying cholera. Turned out we weren't. Then I got a train to Memphis, was discharged, and got another train to Knoxville. When were you And that was the end of my service in uh, March of 1946. And on your return, then what? Well, I started back in school immediately on the GI Bill of Rights, and they paid the tuition and books and supplies and paid us $50 a month. And went straight. I was in a program which allowed you to go three years undergraduate and three years in law school and get both degrees, which cut a year off of the normal program. And I went straight through college, straight through law, law school, except next to the last year of my law school, I was sick for a year out of school. So I got behind. One interesting thing I think happened when I first started law school. I'll back up if you'll allow me. And we were in an old building adjacent to the uh, Church Street United Methodist Church. And the windows on the first floor at the back were great big tall windows and came down all the way to the ground. So you could walk into that classroom through a window and step down into the class. Uh, we had a professor named Judge Jones who had been a former chancellor and would, couldn't see a thing, had real thick lens in his glasses. And one morning, her bacon came through the window and stepped down, and for some reason, I never will figure it out, how Judge Jones knew he was coming down that window, out of that window. But anyway, he asked him, Mr. Bacon, Mr. Bacon, what makes you come here this time of day? And he said, Judge, my alarm clock didn't go off. And the judge said, Mr. Bacon, any man that will predicate his destiny on the infernal workings of an alarm clock will never make a living practicing law. Turned out the judge was wrong. Her Bacon was a very good lawyer. I don't know whether he's still practicing or not. He's a little younger than I am, but he's from Morristown and has been ever since he graduated from law school. Let me back up a second. When you went back to school, did you commute or did you live in Knoxville? Well, after the war, my brother was in class in school too. He didn't go year round, and he didn't go to the war, so he was a little ahead of me, and we rented a, a room near the university, and we occupied that till he graduated from law school. Uh, and we ate uh, at various cheap places with $50 a month. But we could always go down after we'd studied at night to the Toddle House and get chocolate pie, which is the best thing I know. <laughs> you graduated from law school when? In March of 51. Uh, when did Mr. Houston graduate from law school? In, I think in August of 1950. Okay. Which made me 
the low man on the totem pole at Goddard and Gamble. How long were you the low man on the totem pole at Goddard and Gamble? Till you came. Well, that was September of 1974. Yes. And when did you come? In 51. I think that's a record. I don't know for sure, but I think I was low man lo longer than anybody that's ever been that way. Did you ever consider anything other than the practice of law? No. I was like my father, or am like my father. I couldn't be a judge. I took sides too early. Some of, you've talked about Professor Jones when you were at the law school. Are there any other professors when you were going to UT Law School that you can remember? And yes, Colonel Warner, uh, Dr. Overton, uh, Wicker, who was the dean, and most of the students thought that Colonel Warner ought to have been the dean, but he wasn't. And then we had Dick Knoll, for torts. When did he teach torts? Right after lunch. And he was dry as gunpowder. And half of us slept through that class. <laughs> uh, you talked about classmates, Mr. Bacon and Mr. Houston. Remember any other, your, any other of your classmates or fellow students when you were in the law school? Uh, Yes, uh, but my limitation on remembering names, there was this one boy named Smith Jones and I went to school together. And Any extracurricular activity when you were in the law school? I was a member of the Law Review Board. Okay. Did you go straight through law school once you got back from the war? Except for the year I was out sick. Okay. And after you graduated, did you take the bar exam? I did. Was there more than one required at that time? Federal bar you had to take, written exam. And I took it. And if I hadn't had criminal acts on the courthouse steps, I never would have passed it. I beg you, I don't understand what you're trying to tell me. Well, you could I, you could uh, manufacture lots of crimes that were committed on the courthouse steps that were federal crimes because of where they were committed. Okay. And that helped me get through that procedure. And you became admitted to practice in March of 1951. And when I was admitted to practice in federal court, I was immediately appointed to represent somebody. How but, did that work? Well, fortunately, since I didn't know much about what I was doing, the matter got resolved and I never did participate. Never got reappointed in federal criminal never court? Never was appointed again in federal court. Was it predestined that you were going to be joining Goddard and Gamble? Uh, yes, I think so father, as I said, had a stroke, and I think he and uh, Mose and Joe, Joe was the oldest, Joe was 20 years older than I was, and Mose was 10 years older than I was. Now we're talking Mr. Joe Gamble and Mr. Mose Gamble. Right, Judge Gamble's two sons. Okay. And uh, they uh, took us in, Houston and me both, and and we practiced as a firm. We didn't do a whole lot of things individually any time that they were alive. We usually sent two people out. When I started, we went to work at 8 o'clock. We went home at 5 to eat supper. We went back at 7 to and worked till uh, nine or ten. Five days a week? And half a day on Saturday. You joined Goddard and Gamble March 31, 1951? Yes. And you retired from Goddard and Gamble March 28, 2014? Yes. 
calculate that to be about three days shy of 63 years. Yes. When I started practicing law, I started checking titles. And Sam Dunn, who was the attorney for First Federal Savings and Loan and did title work and stayed in the registered office most of the time, uh, taught me how to examine a title and gave me some helpful pointers. And he was the first lawyer in Blount County to celebrate his 60 years of service. Frank Bird was the second one, and I am the third one, and I think that I outlasted both of them. What was it like to practice law with Houston? <laughs> A joke. <laughs> he, he was very funny. He was smart. He was quick. When we were growing up, he'd have his head in an encyclopedia, and I'd be in the kitchen learning how to cook. And I learned from my grandmother Pickens how to peel an apple and have the peeling all in one string tied uh, together. I gather Houston couldn't do that. No, 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 no. He didn't learn how to cook till his first wife died. What was it like to practice law with your son, Rob? Well, it, that was very satisfactory. I don't think I tried to smother him. I, I think I uh, let him make mistakes, let him develop, and I think he's a very good lawyer. And Joe and Mose did that with Houston and me. They uh, helped us. They were available. We did things together. And the practice, our practice mostly was civil practice. And we did wills and uh, uh, drew deeds, did titles, did closings on property, all of that type thing, and handled estates. Joe had an estate that he had open for. 30 years because of the trust that were set up in it. And I had one case that was on a, a decedent who I'd prepared the will for, and she wanted me to be executor. The only problem we had is she died in China, and trying to get a body back from China was a major undertaking. It took a month or so to be able to get that body home. But you were successful? Yes. What was it like practicing law in a small city next to the larger city of Knoxville? Did y'all get over there much? Every once in a while, uh, we, would, we would have a case in Knoxville. We had uh, one case over in Knoxville that I was helping Joe Gamble try, and uh, it was a slip and fall case in the uh, one of the uh, five and dime stores in Knoxville. And Hodges and Dowdy were defending. And about halfway through the trial, they came up to us and started negotiating. They wanted to settle. And we we did settle it. And we come to find out that there had been two slip and falls at the same place in the same store. And they had sent Hodges and Dowdy the wrong file. And their witnesses didn't know a thing about our client. Never saw him her before. So they were trying a different lawsuit than yes, you all were trying. Yes. 
Did you settle it? Yeah, we did. We did, yes. <laughs> uh, was there any competition between you and Houston practicing law here? We, th there, there was only one time that we got mixed up on representation, and that was between Houston and Moe. Moe's turned up at Sessions Court on one side and Houston on the other which was slightly embarrassing. <laughs> and we, of course, they both withdrew immediately. Uh, but we didn't have much competition between, we, we were all in the same boat. What about criminal cases? Because this would all been before public defenders came along. Oh, yes. Well, criminal law turned out to be not one of my loves. We were appointed by Sue Hicks, who the ballad of a boy named Sue was written about. I wonder uh, if Johnny Cash knows that. Yeah. Uh, and the judge would appoint you and say, go out in the hall and talk to this fella, and we'll be ready to try your lawsuit uh, in about 20 minutes. And there wasn't any change. We had one case that uh, D.K. Thomas, who was a very fine lawyer in Maryville, and I were appointed to represent these two defendants who were accused of robbing a man that was on leave from Eastern State Psychiatric Hospital and had been chopping wood to earn enough money to buy his mother a Christmas present. And of course, we didn't do very well. Some reason you didn't particularly care for the criminal law? No, I was appointed to represent this fellow who was being prosecuted by the highway patrol. And right or wrong, he convinced me that he was innocent that he was being framed, and with the lack of time and, and opportunity to interview witnesses, there wasn't a thing I could do about it. And I said, I've had enough of this. I'm going to go somewhere, I mean, go in a different direction if I can. And so I didn't try many criminal cases. We tried, more than I tried one defending his lady for killing her husband. And we made a mistake in selecting the jury and had let a man sit on the jury whose brother we had helped send to the penitentiary. So we had a hung jury the first time. Second time around, while well, we won it. Uh, was civil trial? Tell us about civil trials back at that time, before these rules of civil procedure became enacted in the early seventies. Well, you didn't have any discovery depositions. Uh, and we often left our client over here in the office for fear the defendant the plaintiff would put him on the stand and prove their lawsuit when they couldn't prove their lawsuit otherwise. Uh, but it was a uh, bad situation. Justice had been served by the new rules and the discovery and the opportunity to, to find out what the truth is. Uh, it makes the litigation a lot more lengthy, a lot more expensive, but it's been good. We, uh, when I started practicing, we had only had 18 members of the bar, and of course you knew everybody, and we didn't give serve notices on anybody. We didn't take try to take depositions without trying to 
find an agreeable date. We didn't take default judgments or try to take default judgments unless we had worn the other party out uh, before we did anything like that. We tried to be agreeable. And, uh, cause, you know, if you were mean, uh, things would come around and after a while you'd be in the same position. So we got along collegially very well, I think, when I started. We've been at this about an hour. Why don't we just take a break for a few minutes? Is that all right? Fine. That's fine. Am I doing too detailed? Okay, we're back, Mr. A.B. Uh, you, we were talking about... <clears throat> Going to Knoxville and Knoxville lawyers and so forth, what was the relationship with the Blunt County Bar, the Knoxville Bar, the Knoxville lawyers, the Blunt County lawyers? How, how was that back in the 50s and 60s and 70s? Well, uh, we had a, a pretty good relationship with most uh, 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 Knoxville lawyers that came to try cases in Blunt County. Our practice had been established that we uh, went to Sevier County quite often, Monroe County quite often, Loudoun County quite often. We went to Knoxville, but we didn't go beyond Knoxville. We, we did, just didn't have any practice there. And of course the federal court was in Knoxville, and uh, we had to go there to try any kind of case that was filed either by us or somebody else. Uh, and I thought the Knoxville lawyers thought we were reasonably adequate and uh, we, we thought they, they had some good lawyers too. There was some jealousy about them coming over sometimes and taking our cases and the usual animosity, but not deep or serious. At that time, was it common for <clears throat> for um, Knoxville lawyers to often use Blunt County lawyers to pick juries over here? That was that was done quite often. We had this one case where we were, were in a will contest uh, or will interpretation where the man had drawn his own will. And Judge Buford Townsend was delivering his opinion, and we didn't have a court reporter. And we, uh, they, Carson, lawyer in Knoxville with the Associated Joe, in the trial of this case, and Houston and I were there. And they said, take note, take note, take note. And Judge Townsend got so bumfuzzled and asked questions and was such a harassment and such a jumbled up opinion that uh, they decided they wouldn't want any notes to take, <laughs> that they didn't want the record to show how he re reached his conclusion. Now, Ch Chancellor Townsend was not from Blunt County, was he? No, no. He was from Sevier. Sevier County? Did he have a reputation about not deciding lawsuits? Yes. Father went up one time to see the former chancellor, and he went up sometime in the spring, and he said if Judge Townsend starts deciding his lawsuits right now, he would still be at it late summer, but it didn't do any good. And when he got off the bench, there were a bunch of files missing. 
and he had traded cars. And they started looking for his old car, and it was still with the deal and hadn't been sold, and they got in the trunk, and they found a bunch of files. Of course, they weren't appeal files. They were original files in the uh, uh, Chantry Court. And he told, the rumor is that he told his successor that a certain case he could not decide because the chancellor had promised both sides. Now that may be not what you want me to answer, but uh, we we did not go very often but above Knoxville. Were there any Blunt County judges? I mean, the chancellor you said came from Sevier County. Was the circuit judge from here or the criminal judge from here, or did they also ride a circuit? They rode a circuit, but the criminal judge was from Monroe County and Sue K. Hicks, and the, uh, the uh, civil judge was Wayne Oliver. Now, Judge Oliver was from Maribel. Yes. Okay. Cage Cove, he'd let you know. A part of the Oliver family from Cades Cove. Yes, his father was a hard shell Baptist preacher and a, a uh, uh, postman delivery man. How were these judges back in the 50s and 60s? Judge Oliver, Judge Hicks. We already talked about the chancellor, but. Well, they, they uh, were pretty good. I didn't like the appointments they gave us, uh, no time to prepare in criminal cases. And Judge Oliver uh, was fair, we thought, but his father said when he was wrong, he was the wrongest wrong of anybody he ever saw. As an example of that, we had to, obligation of acquiring by condemnation or purchase the right to way for the Foothills Parkway, which ran from Wallen down to the Teleco River. And we tried one, and the engineer didn't take our witnesses to the right track of land. They never saw the track of land. And when they testified, there wasn't any trees on it. And when the defendant took the stand, they had photographs showing big trees, and we were just clobbered. So then we tried one uh, on the same project with the same lawyer on the other side, which was Ron Mears Jr.'s father. And we did see the right track. We had a different jury, and uh, the verdict was considerably less. And Rom filed a motion to gain a new trial on the grounds that the verdicts were inconsistent in the two cases, which we thought was spurious. And we gave every reason. We argued it at Judge Oliver's home on Saturday morning. And we argued everything we could think of, uh, of why there wasn't any precedent for granting a new cop trial because one case didn't jive with the other case as far as the verdict is concerned. And Judge Oliver, we, we could tell by his actions that he was about to buy that argument. So finally I thought of the idea of asking him what he would do if they had been tried in the other order. That is, the low one first and the high one second. Would he grant a new trial to reduce the verdict in the second one? 
And I think he finally realized that he was on thin ground and he denied the motion. Joe and Ray Jenkins were trying a lawsuit. Burdine was our client, and it was right after Ray got back from the Army hearings in Washington. And our client, Burdine, was accused of shooting into the house of his neighbor. And Houston and I were hanging around just because it was Ray, and, and we wanted to learn all we could and we were back in the library getting ready for the trial the next day, and Ray turned to Houston and me, and he said, now you're going to be there tomorrow, aren't you? And we said, oh, no, no, we're not going to be there. Oh, he said, yes, you, you are. If we lose it, we want somebody to pack it on. <laughs> but anyway, they got in the middle of the trial, and they called Mr. Burdine's wife. And his defense was that he was shooting at a dog who was disturbing his wife who was sickly. So we called her to the stand, and the courtroom had double doors on the side with the jury in two rows facing the judge. And they, we looked up and here the two white coated gentlemen were pushing a stretcher into the courtroom with <clears throat> Ms. Burdine on it. And Judge Sue Hicks hit the ceiling. And he said, can't she get up? And Ray said, I don't know, Your Honor. I'll ask her. So he leaned down and said, little lady, can you get up? She said, no. And he said, she, Ray turned to the judge and said, she says she can't, Your Honor. So we asked her a couple of questions. And the attorney, then Ray in his a loud voice said, cross-examine Attorney General. And of course, the general didn't want anything to do with that woman. He wanted to get her out of that courtroom. And uh, he didn't ask her anything. But of course, the jury was not going to send Mr. Verdine to the penitentiary with his wife bedfast. So that was the end of that lawsuit. Uh, let's talk about some of the the clients that uh, that Goddard and Gamble had in those years, and and the relationships that you all have had at that time. The Bank of Maribel was one of the firm's clients. Yes. And what type of work did you all do for the Bank of Maribel? We did about everything they had done. They were not uh, into uh, a lot of activities. We did titles, drew trust deeds, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, Filed their lawsuits, defended their lawsuits? Yes, yes. And after you got here, you defended some of them, or brought some of them or on uh, bankruptcy matters. Uh, and our representation, Dad was chairman of the board when he had his stroke and stayed till he died. And I was elected to the board the next year in January. And I stayed until Joe reached retirement at 70 years. And then I became chairman of the board. And Billy Adams was the president, and he had uh, split the stock. Originally, it sold for $400 a share, and he split it several times and expanded the uh, 
operations of the bank. And the first Tennessee wanted to buy First Tennessee, and our holding company, of course, owned all the stock in the bank. And I was involved in negotiating that sale. The stock had been selling for $25, and they had finally offered 110 in which I knew that I could not defend not taking that offer, if you excuse my double negative. Uh, Billy Adams wasn't too in love with First Tennessee, but we did complete the sale and in 1983, and after that I was no longer chairman because we didn't own the bank. Now, Mr. Adams became the commissioner of banking at the time the Butcher Empire fell. Yes, he did, and sold that to First Tennessee. Same bank apparently he didn't like too much. Yes, <laughs> but it didn't matter over there. I understand. How much work is there when you're serving as the chairman of the board of a bank? I mean, does it, is there a lot of time involved in that? Well, the, the, there was the finance committee that that had to approve loans over a certain amount. And it met weekly on Wednesday. And I was presided at that meeting every Wednesday and presided at the, at the uh, 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 director's meeting, which was once a month. And uh, of course, we met with the president in, in talking about, or the other officers of the bank, for that matter, talking about loans and what they need to do to get them in shape to be approved. And it took some time. It was not a full-time job, but uh, it took some time to do that. And one of the other clients, still clients, Blunt Memorial Hospital. Tell us about that relationship. Well, the hospital was a joint effort of the city of Merrill, city of Alcor, Blunt County, and the Lumen Company, and a public subscription of money. Uh, and the donation of labor to accomplish its beginning. And a member of our church gave $50,000 in 1947, which was a lot of money. We passed an act of the legislature which granted the county the right to build and operate a hospital or to form a corporation to operate the hospital. And we were able to contribute to that effort because we were attorneys for all four entities. Uh, we didn't do all the only companies work, but we did workers' comp settlements and that kind of thing. And that was in 1947. And the board, uh, the charter was obtained and it was signed by representatives of all three governments. And the, the bylaws, I mean the charter provided that the directors would be elected uh, four from the county and two from each city and one from Maryland College. The idea being that the county couldn't control it, and the two cities couldn't control it because they had to have the college vote. The county in one city could control it, but we didn't think that was likely, or they didn't. I wasn't in the firm till 51, four years later. Uh, and then 
in the beginning, the three governments put money into the operation of the hospital because it wasn't making enough money to operate itself. After it got on its feet, it operated successfully till they issued some bonds. County did that the hospital was obligated to repay. But the census at the hospital and the money being made by the hospital proved to be inadequate to retire the bonds in the order in which they were issued on a short-term basis. But we made a big addition at the hospital at that time. So we had to go back to the county and try to get permission to refinance it. And we got in a knockdown drag out fight. And the commission was split. Uh, right down the middle, so that there was an equal number of people for and an equal number of votes against. And Bob Davis, who was then county executive uh, and presiding officer of the county court, stepped down from the, his position and voted to save the hospital. Interesting part about that vote was that the, the first motion was to refinance. The second motion was to enter into agreement with the hospital to pay the bond. And the same people voted against the first one, voted against the second one. And Bob Davis still had to step down and pass that vote. And after that, Joe Dawson became administrator, and I became chief attorney for the hospital. 1985. And stayed until, and Connie Davis became chairman of the board, and we all, uh, Joe and I stayed together till his retirement. And that was several years later. 2010? And Joe undertook to uh, reestablish relationship with the county commission. He started acquiring specialists to come in, recruit them to come into the county so that we could expand the service we were given. The, uh, During the, the, the process, the, the legislature passed an act known as the Metropolitan Hospital Authority Act, which gave the hospitals broader authority than they had as a government to compete with private hospitals. Uh, then they passed what is known as the Erlinger Law, which said it's a private act, uh, Metropolitan Hospital Authority. So the 13 hospitals that were government and were much smaller in different communities as a group decided they ought to have the same privileges that the Metropolitan Hospital Authority did. So I talked to the fellow who was preparing the bill in Nashville, and he would had prepared it to be effective for any uh, uh, hospital that was created by the legislature. Well, we weren't created by the legislature. The legislature authorized us, so we got it, that changed and got it passed. Joe Dawson wanted some way to pay in lieu of taxes to the government, 
as other hospitals were doing. And I told him I didn't know any authority for him to divert money that had been created by the rendering of services by the hospital to sick patients to the government for in lieu of taxes. But this bill provided for that. But we didn't get in the act the fact that no property of the hospital was real or personal was taxable. So we tried to get an amendment. And two senators on each one on each side agreed and announced on the Senate floor that they'd agreed that the, the act would be amended so that the property owned by the hospital authority in the county of origin would be exempt. But any outside the county would have to go through a procedure with the State Board of Equalization. Were y'all finally able to get that resolved? Finally. We couldn't get our legislators to do what I thought they ought to have done, and that was correct, correct the mistake that was made <clears throat> in the passing of the legislation. Well, I want to go back to something. We, we didn't talk, you talked about serving on the Budget and Finance okay. Committee of the county, and, 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 and when you were on the Budget and Finance Committee of the county, what did you all do to try to take care of the county debt that, that ended up before you had to build these new two high schools in the county back in the late 1970s? Well, <coughs> excuse me, I was employed by the Asher Howard as the uh, attorney for the uh, county judge. And he appointed me to the Budget and Finance Committee. And they tried to convince me, they being several people, that I couldn't get along with that Budget and Finance Committee. Ken Tippins and Snag Hayes were Democrats, and Harsh McCammon and Delosier Rondi were Republican. But it turned out I didn't have a bit of problem with them. They were as conservative as I was. They wanted to do what was best for the county. We didn't have political discussions or votes. Uh, they weren't looking out to preserve their position. And one of the things we did, this started out in a high interest rate environment. So we did devised a plan whereby I would prepare a resolution to be adopted by the county commission, county court then, to authorize the county, the county judge to solicit bids on county capital outlay notes which were used, the proceeds of which would be used to buy cruisers and other capital needs of the county and the offices in the county. Uh, added an interest rate on the note not exceeding 6%. So we would issue those and spend that money for that purpose then the trustee could invest what was in the sinking fund or debt service reserve fund at 15, 16, 17 percent. So, and any excess funds went into the sinking fund according to the way the county was operating. What was the result? Result, we, we were making money. What happened to the debt? We paid it off. Then what happened when you needed to borrow money to build the schools? Well, later, the county had never built a, uh, a first-class school. And they wanted to build two new high schools. 
and we had trouble with the uh, rating commission, uh, rating authorities. They said, we haven't got any record of where you paid any debt in the last few years. And our response was, we couldn't have a record of paying when we've already paid them off. But that didn't seem to influence them. But we did get the bonds issued and did build the two high schools. The state, in their financial arrangement, estimated the increase in sales tax revenue each year. If he didn't make it, if it wasn't that much, they had to uh, uh, cut the bu budget back and pound the money. So we adopted a plan of estimating the budget based on the sales tax collection from the previous year, knowing that any increase over that could be always be spent. There was always need for money. Well, the state didn't like that. They thought that was awful. No. But we didn't ever have to impound any money because we were never uh, un uh, overestimated our revenue. Now, you mentioned the Budget and Finance Committee had two Democrats and two Republicans. What were you? The third member, fifth member. And what party were you from? Well, I have been a Republican all my life. Uh, Should I ask you why? Well, I was uh, got it by inheritance. <laughs> my mother uh, was a Democrat and a Presbyterian. And our family was Republican and Methodist. We persuaded Mother to become a Republican. She did join the Methodist Church, but she never became a Methodist. She was always a Presbyterian. Uh I know that you served as general counsel for the hospital from 1985 until 2010 when Mr. Dawson, its administrator, retired. What was the financial situation of the hospital when you started as general counsel in 85 and, and when you retired in 2010? Well, the financial picture was very bleak. We got hit with a $50,000 lawsuit a few days after Joe took office because of the discharge of certain nurses because we didn't have the business to need their services. And that was worked out. And as I said a minute ago, he began to improve our relationships. He began uh, recruiting specialists, expanding the services up that the hospital offered and our reserves were very minimal when he took office. And when he retired, they were $150 million. $150 million, excuse me. And I was pleased to be a part of that operation and contribute what I did. Uh, what was the firm's relationship with Merrill College? Well, we were the uh, attorney for the college. Uh, Judge Gamble almost got expelled from Merrill College for chewing tobacco in the college woods. And Joe was a great supporter, Joe Gamble was a great supporter of Merrill College. And he uh, 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 was on the board. 
and he's buried in the college cemetery. He and his wife. And all that relationship lasted certainly as long as, as Joe was alive. Yes. Okay. Yes, it did. Um, you've talked about a lot of these investments and, and high finance issues. Where did you, where did you get your expertise to to be dealing with these large sums of monies and coming up with these plans to save money and make money and, and leave the entity in better shape than it was when you found it? Well, I guess part of it was just damn fool luck. We were in a high rate environment and the bonds that we were asking the county judge to solicit bid for were tax exempt. And so the entities that loaned the money didn't pay any taxes on those bonds. That's why they would buy them at 6%. Uh, I don't know any, any better answer. Before I get into your community activities and career overview, there was one case that you and I talked about with regard to when you and Mr. Mose were dealing with the Contribution Among Tort Feasers Act and a rather interesting story with regard to that. Would you relate that to us, please? All right. Mose and I were in federal court before Judge Taylor. J.W. B. Baker, I think, was the, the uh, lawyer on the other side. Uh, and the question was, what was the correct interpretation of a ruling that the Supreme Court opinion, Supreme Court had written on the contribution among joint tort features. Judge Wilson had decided one or two cases interpreting that. Now that was Judge Wilson, the federal judge in Chattanooga? That's right. Okay. And then Judge Taylor followed his opinion. And that's Judge Robert Taylor from Knoxville. Right. And we, Mose and I, were of the opinion they were both wrong. So we filed pleadings to that effect. In Judge Taylor's court? Yes, and to our amazement, he gave us leave to file a declaratory judgment case to determine what the correct uh, interpretation of that opinion was. So we filed it before Judge Broughton in Knox County, and it was summarily dismissed. We appealed it to the Court of Appeals, and after it was argued, they decided against us. Then we uh, filed a petition petition for certiorari with the Supreme Court, which was granted. And by that time, Mose was so tired of it. He said, you're going to have to argue this in, in, in uh, Supreme Court. So I said, okay. So I did. And the Supreme Court decided that both Judge Wilson, Judge Taylor, Court of Appeals, and Judge Broughton were all wrong, so we won it. Later we found out that Judge Taylor? Taylor had called up Hamilton Burnett, who was Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and said, I've got these lawyers filed pleadings in my court saying that Judge Wilson and I are both wrong in our interpretation of your opinion. And Judge Burnett said, you damn right you're wrong. And that's how come we got the time to file the pleadings. There wasn't any procedure for the federal court to ask the state court for what the law was at that time. When Mr. Houston was on the bench, what happened to the cases that Goddard and Gamble had that would be going to the Court of Appeals? Uh, he would arrange not to be sitting. We didn't want him messing with our lawsuits. <laughs> 
I knew that was coming. Let's talk about uh, anything else you want to tell us about the practice of law. I was going to go into some community stuff now, but I didn't want to cut you off. Anything else you'd like for us to hear? Well, Mold and I, I'll give you two examples. Mold and I were representing a, a French lady who married a Blunt County boy who was in the service over there during the war. They had a baby and they got into domestic problems. And the mother, as was customary, had custody temporarily until the case could be heard. But the father had visitation rights and he wouldn't bring the child back. So we were before Judge Oliver and trying to get an order to require him to bring the child back. And during the middle of it, our client stood up and said, Your Honor, my daughter is trying to tell her father that she needs to go to the bathroom. And Judge turned down to the court reporter, which was his wife, and said, did you get that? <laughs> and she said, yes. And, of course, that was the end of that matter. But I've always wondered that if the only two people in the courtroom that could speak French were our client and her daughter, whether she really was trying to go to the bathroom, or did our client make that story up? Uh, another interesting case I tried by myself, and it was late in life, and these uh, black people came to see me about a church and cemetery on Amarine Road, which was called the Amarine A.M.E. Zion Church, and said there had been a woman out there preaching, and she was white. So I got to the courthouse and found out that she had gotten a deed for somebody that hadn't no more title to that property than I have. And I found out that that was part of the property that a black family had owned after the Civil War that later became Asbury Acres in their development. And there wasn't any deed to the church, to, for the church or the cemetery. So I formed an organization of, uh, and I mean, uh, people who were, had folks buried there, or knew folks buried there, or had attended ser services there, had any connection with the cemetery. We weren't interested much in the church. But it, I couldn't win a lawsuit on the weakness of my adversary's title. I had to win it on the strength of my own. And my clients had no more claim to the property than I did or the defendant. So I thought the only way I can win this lawsuit is to bring it in the name of the conference of the AME Zion Church in which this particular church had been a part of because Methodists always have a, a proposition that if a church goes out of business, the property reverts to the conference. Well, I finally located the bishop in, in St. Louis and talked to him about it, and he was coming to Knoxville. So I went over there 
to meet with him and try to convince him to let me bring this lawsuit in the name of the conference with the understanding that my client would pay for the trial of the lawsuit and the cost of the cause. Uh, did and he, agree? he He agreed to that. Did you file the suit? Yes, I did. And I found, got certified copies of minutes of the conference appointing preachers to this uh, uh, parish. And I found what we call ancient documents, which was newspapers <laughs> that announced the burial of somebody in this cemetery or the funeral of somebody in this cemetery. And armed with that, then I went to before Judge Young and we uh, won our lawsuit. But all I could, had succeeded in doing was getting the title to the property into the AME Zion Church the conference, and they wanted money. My, they weren't going to use it. So about that was my end of the involvement. But apparently it was worked out because they have moved the church to the Heritage Museum at Townsend. I think that's the name of it. Uh, and it is, the church is in that position. You talk and I think they uh, conveyed the cemetery in the property the conference did to the, the my clients or their organization, and I don't know what they paid, if anything. You talked about the work you did with regard to the, getting the acquisition of the property for the Foothills Parkway. What did you all have to do with the acquisition of the widening of the Alcoa Highway? We represented the state in acquiring right away in Blunt County for widening of the park. An interesting time in that lawsuit was when we had a jury view go out to view the property. And Maggie, somebody had a restaurant at the intersection of the Alcoa Highway and the uh, uh, Air Base Road. And we got to her property, and she served the jury view stack key. And there wasn't much we could do about that. Served what? Stack cake. What's that? That's the small layers of molasses cake with uh, apple oh, okay. or uh, a, um, apricot between the layers. Now this was a jury of you was supposed to go out and determine how much her property was worth? Yes. And she was serving them stack cake? Yes. We didn't have any stack cake. Anyway, they, uh, jury of you came back with a uh, a value we thought was very excessive. But this lady was a Democrat, and the state was Democratic, and they would not let us appeal it. So we had to pay the full price the jury of you had rendered, verdict had rendered. But you all did all the work that was necessary to get the Alcoa Highway four lane, at least from the airport out to the county line. Yes. And then somebody else, I guess, took care of the Knox County side. Right. right. What about the widening of the road going from from Hubbard up to Townsend? Well, we were hired by the state to acquire that right of way, which was from Hubbard, the end uh of the road to Townsend and beyond to the park. And we were required to acquire a 300-foot right-of-way, which was 
Go ahead. Very, very excessive, we thought, but anyway, that's what they wanted. And they've now built four lane roads on it. Okay, we need to take another break just for a few minutes and we'll be right back with this, okay? Sorry. <laughs> 